Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Hey, Charles, can you turn me up just a little bit? Because I tend to attempt to compensate for not being able to hear myself, and then I start yelling. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. And if it's too loud, turn me down. Sorry, now it's a little too loud. <laughs> uh, check one, two, one, two, one, two. Good morning, good morning. Welcome, everyone. And uh, my name is Sven, and my wife, Amber, and I, we volunteer here. It's, we were looking at the calendar recently, and it was six years ago we moved here to Sudden Valley, and I remember it was that moment where Jason was getting out of the wheelchair and get his, his healing up those knees for that Easter service. I remember, remember that Sunday, and, and uh, it's been a, we are thankful for the journey that uh, we've had with you all. My son Tenzin is downstairs somewhere, and daughter Vesper, 11 and 9, and thank you all for being a community where we, where we get to serve Jesus. The name of my Jesus talk this morning, the title is How to Invite Jesus into Our Real Life Struggles, Trials, Tests, Temptations. And uh, thank you for, for, cl for cleaning. No, no, no worries. This morning I bring a message of encouragement and hope, and today can be a new start, a new beginning for us. And for many of us this morning, I'm not bringing new information, but I am reminding us of what we already know, but we, uh, we easily forget. We're not alone in our trials, tests, and temptations, and we mustn't forget what God has spoken uh, to us through Scripture. Like a seed, we die. We are crucified with Christ, but Easter Sunday is coming. And we will live again. Loss. Disappointment. Illness. I'm going for the big list. Criticism. Betrayal. Uh, lack. Adversity. Moments where we're seduced by lies. Bad choices we've made. Mistakes. We know we're not enough to face this stuff. We're not enough to face these tests, these trials, these temptations. But when we become aware of our deep need and say this simple prayer, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I can't make it without you. Jesus responds by, by not necessarily making all, it all better, but by walking us down through that valley, right? Psalm 23, through the valley of the shadow of death. Jesus literally walking with us in, in and through that. Just like Jason just mentioned to the kids. Because God our creator knows us better than we know ourselves. God knows just what we need to make it through to the other side. God, God, God knows us. Like, we, 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 we wonder if he really gets us, but he knows us better than we know ourselves. Uh, I'm, already, I'm already emotional this morning. I'm just thankful for, the, uh, for God's faithfulness in my life. Um, I've had a chance to know Jesus my whole life. And, uh, and that's been hard sometimes, because every time I've ever rejected God or gone my own way I knew totally I knew totally what I was doing like like God has been close to me my whole life and uh but God's love is faithful God's good to us in all the the heavy stuff and then also just the fun just details of life um I, I wore my insulated rain boots this morning I figure this was my one Sunday where I could wear them and show them off. Um, I've ne I, I've, I'm a Colorado kid. We don't have, insul at least, not that I know of. No one I knew had insulated rain boots in Colorado. Maybe they do. I don't know. But I never did. I never knew anyone who did. Uh, we had, like, water-resistant snow boots. That's what we had. And so I go to the dog park a lot. 
and uh, with our dog, doggy Stella. And at the dog park, I'd look around, you know, and I'd look at all these. In my mind, since I'm from Colorado, I'm always like, oh, these are real Washington people. I need to learn from them. So I look around the dog park, and they all, and lots of people in that muddy dog park have these insulated water boots, rain boots. And I'm like, someday, someday I will own a pair of those and be a real Washington person. And finally this year, six years in, I got my boots. So I just, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. <laughs> And, in, you know, and that's just some dumb little thing, right? But isn't that how God works? God, like, God works in all of it, right? And so my first point this morning is this. Receive God's smile of grace. God sings over you. His very voice holds the universe together. Brought initial life. Created the universe with his words. God sings over you and empowers you with what is grace. Grace is just that little bit of favor that you need, that mercy that you need, that love that you need, that justice. Ooh, justice is a, is a tough one, right? So it's not just, oh, God gets you and you're okay. It's like, no, God really does get you, and, and he really does love you in all of your mess, and he does see that justice needs to happen in your, in your life, and that there are real things that need to change, and there are real problems in the world we live in. So I want to jump to Scripture, but anytime I go there, anytime I open up the Bible, I, I, I often like to remind us that the Christian Bible, um, we get it from, uh, for those of you who are, if there's anyone here or anyone online who is new to Christianity, you'll, during my Jesus talk, a number of times I'm going to jump into Scripture. Um, I, have my, I have my Scriptures written out in my notes, so for my symbolic Bible that I'm just pointing at. I've got, a, I've got an Italian Bible. I worked on a lot of Italian last year. And my favorite thing about my Italian Bible is that the book of John is Giovanni. I mean, it's pretty cool when you open up the book of Giovanni. Anyways. So the original writers of the Bible were inspired by God. And the church... Followers of Jesus were inspired to gather it up and decide what, they sh what should be in the Bible. Literally go, oh, no, we really do see that that is God's word. Well, that isn't. And we as readers today, we're inspired to hear God in the reading of this redemption story. We, God inspires us today as we hear his word. Do we get to, like, reinvent it any way we want? No, no. But we are inspired by God. We are inspired by the Holy Spirit. What is the Bible? The Bible is the redemption story of one family in a very personal way. Um, and God's plan to use this one family to redeem all of humanity, every nation, every people. And so we read this redemption story, and it influences us today. We hear God's voice in it today, and Paul, in his letter to Timothy in Ephesus, pretty sure that's what Timothy was, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 says this, He saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Grace is one of those Christian words. We know, we kind of vaguely know what it is, and we know it's good. But it's, it, and we, and we're, it, but it's challenging to just wrap our brains around it. We have to be reminded again and again. So grace is that, that little bit of empowerment that we need. Not so that we can be like self, uh, self-empowered or something, but just enough so that we can respond to God's goodness. God always initiates. God always makes the first move. God always invites us first and gives us just enough grace so that we can respond and say, yes, Jesus, I need you. That's grace. That little bit of favor, that little bit of mercy, that little bit of power, that little bit of something that we need because we, we get so down in it that we, that we can't respond to God without that grace. 
But when I look at my own life, I say, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't we rather try to get our act together first before getting God involved? Um, at least show a solid effort, you know, like I, with my own kids, like I'm often like, just make a solid effort and I'll meet you, you know, I'll meet you in the process, right? But we don't always have a solid effort in us, do we? Uh, but we fake it, right? Maybe ignore uh, what's really going on inside us. Maybe fake it just long enough to, to make it seem to when maybe we can change on our own. But God wants the real us, the real you, with some strengths. You you actually do have some strengths. You don't just have to approach God, I am a worm, I am nothing. It's like, no, God, you created me in your image. There's, there, your fingerprint is on my life. There's some good stuff in here, but mostly it's, mostly it's, it's not good stuff. There's some accomplishments, there's some stuff, but there's a lot of weakness in us. And so my next point is this. We must be deeply honest about what pulls us. Be deeply honest about what tugs on your heart, what triggers you, what just grabs you and you go, whoa, my heart just gets, whoa, like I just, I see this situation, I'm just jealous and I'm like, why is that in me? Or I just, I get angry about this one thing over and over again. Pay attention to desire. Desire is one of those, uh, I preach this often if you've heard me give Jesus talks, but there, there's something about uh, religion that makes, that wants to tell you that desire is, desire is wrong. But the enemy of our soul, Satan loves, is not, Satan is not cr- a creator. We, we, don't, we don't live in a, in Christianity, we don't believe that there's like this, um, this, that we're in this battle of good and evil with this, and 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 uh, instead we instead we believe, yeah, there's a battle between good and evil, but God is completely sovereign, and God at a moment could just win the whole battle, but instead God, out of His patience and His kindness, allows allows for the battle to continue so that more more can respond to His goodness. So paying attention to desire. Sometimes there's the desire in us, and we just don't even know what it's all about. And it, oftentimes, the easiest way to get to desire is go, how am I completely messing up? Where are the places in my life where I'm just rejecting God? Oh, there's, des- there's desire in there. And desire is good because God can... Re- all- God-, God just wants repentance because he can take that desire. Desire is like fuel. And God's like, Let- we can just point the the car of your life back towards Jesus let's you turn this thing let's get on the road of repentance and let's point this desire to your goodness Jesus let's 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 point this desire back towards God's God's original intent and so we're called to live an examined life look for the good and the bad and I encourage us this morning, everyone, I'll go see, I'll go days and days and I'll do a good job with this. And then I'll go weeks and weeks and, and not do a good job in this. Um, but it is such a profound habit to take a couple of minutes at the end of each day and go, God, where, where did I feel farthest away from you today, God? That's usually for me, it's always easier to go negative first because I kind of have this negative strain inside me. And so I'm like, where am I a complete loser? <laughs> and then it's like, I can get there easy. And then I go, okay, God, those moments where I felt so far away from you, I give those to you. I can just give that to you. Um, but where were your invitations? Where did I get a sense that you were real today and that your, your creation is good and somewhere in the mundane and in the awesomeness of my life that I could just feel your goodness. Oh, you know, there was that moment today. And that's an exam in life of just taking those couple of minutes and, and oh, I, I, I challenge us to, to do better at that. Um, maybe once a week to kind of where in this week. I recently had a birthday and I'm 47 years old. Woo! 
<laughs> I didn't. Uh, I I enjoy claps, but like. <laughs> um, but one of my favorite things about a birthday is to kind of look back and go, oh God, just to examine that a little bit and go, God, where were you this year? Like where? Like my favorite devotion, one of my favorite devotion times of the year is like Christmas morning, early in the morning, or like my birthday early in the morning. And I just kind of, for some reason in that moment, it feels natural to examine my life and go, okay, where are you at, God? Where are you at? David, the psalmist in the book of Psalms, which is really the prayer book of Christianity, and Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24 says this, Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. The Psalms are, are full of just the honesty far deeper than... Um, it, I love that it's our prayer book because <laughs> if you go back and read Psalm 139, the whole chapter the whole psalm. I read it this morning. Right before this part, David is just like, just talking about how he hates God's enemies. And he, he just, he's just like, there's this, there's this thing in his heart where he just wants vengeance. And he just, and he just, he kind of just lays it all out. Just, and then he, and then at the end of that, he says this, search me, God. <laughs> um, and so, we're challenged by the Psalms to be more honest than we are, to, 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 to give God all of who we are. My next point is this. Listen for the yes instead of focusing on the no. God invites us into freedom and connectedness to the Holy Spirit instead of just dampening passions with a list of rules. Now, rules are helpful. You know, little kids, it's good to have some rules. You know, and it's like, um, and more and more as kids grow up, you, you start to explain, okay, we've always had these rules, but you, what was underneath the rule? <laughs> it's like, the rule has been, do not go in the front yard. <laughs> okay, but now that you're a little older, I want you to know, because there's a crazy busy road right there, and, and, and we didn't think you had the, know, the, the, the know-how to stay in the yard and away from, and so you've been playing in the backyard all this time, because we didn't, we weren't able to explain to you why you couldn't play in the front yard. And so that's a small example. But rules are really good um, baby steps. They're good um, training wheels. They're good. They get us going. Um, in my life where I've faced, where I've been in the middle of addictions and just bad habits and just sometimes it's helpful just the only way you can just come up for air out of addiction is just be like, and I will not even live my life, I will stand here and not move. <laughs> you know, like, you just, there's moments where you just need rules, okay? But then over time, it's not sustainable. And, uh, and we need wisdom from God to know, to, to know how to move beyond that. Initially, these rules keep us from drowning, but long term, the only sustainable way to make it through is with ongoing connectedness, connectedness to Jesus moment to moment, ongoing dialogue, ongoing conversation. We begin to understand, like, I am God's home. You are God's home. We can talk to Jesus anytime. Jesus, perfect representation of our Heavenly Father, living inside of us through the Holy Spirit, God begins to do good works in us. We, we can celebrate freedom. We can go, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for today. Like, I just, I felt close to you. And just to start to have these little one-sentence dialogues, because he's right there. He's right there. Nobody can take it away from you. It's one of the most profound things in life, is that we literally were created with the ability, we could even lose our ability to talk, and we could still talk to Jesus on the inside. We learn the awe and the wonder of seeing God's good gifts. And that dialogue isn't just like, oh, I messed up again. Oh, I'm about to mess up. Yeah, that's a part of it. But it's also like, 
wow, I just love that our church meets in this old barn. And it's kind of imperfect, and it's kind of impossible to clean, you know? It's just, and, it, and it's just, it kind of matches the interior decorating of my soul. Thank you, Jesus, that I get to go to church here in, in its realness, you know, and just, and just kind of seeing that um, in your life. Look up at that fog in the foothills. I, 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 I still am amazed by, I need some scientific weather person to explain to me that because we're close to the ocean and the foothills and why we always have this fog, I don't know, but it's awesome right? And I'm always admiring it, and, uh, and, and, and that's a part of my dialogue. It's like, God, every time I see the fog, I, I think of you. I had a spiritual mentor. He used to say, he was a Colorado person, so this happened less often. He said, every time I see a bald eagle, every time I see an eagle, I know God's on the move. And I was like, well, in Washington, man, God is always on the move. Like, <laughs> we, we, have, we have so many eagles, we don't even know what to do with them. And, uh, and so just that awe and that, that like, oh, that wonder in our hearts. Paul, in his letter to the church in Galatia, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, says this. So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. You, the spirit of God begins to work in us and change our hearts. From the inside out. But how is our inner life really going? Where do we get stuck? Personally, I can get stuck in the sadness of life. Um, I go looking for music about rejection, heartbreak. I have this unhealthy desire to just sit in the sadness. I don't, it's just kind of part of my makeup, I think. Um, sometimes I crave adventure, risk-taking. And I think about short-term gratification ways to meet my needs on my own instead of God's good plans to meet my, like my deepest needs over the course of a lifetime, over the course of eternity. But can we let God's eternal priorities reorder our lives? God cares about heart change and what motivates our inner life much more than our image or appearance or brand, personal brand. Paul, in his letter to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 and 8 through 18, says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is seen. We fix our eyes not... On what is seen but on what is unseen since what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal we, we, we fix our eyes on the spiritual things and, and out of that we're able to appreciate the physical world we're able to appreciate everything around us but our hearts our hearts have a lot of stuff going on inside of them I fear rejection and I, I always hope that if I can be prepared enough, smart enough, funny enough, likable enough, if I can control all the variables, then maybe I'll finally be enough. And so I get caught up in creating some kind of persona. A story about self that is marketable, something you can actually describe and people go, oh, I get you, I understand you. Something to help give me influence, maybe open doors for me. If I could just, if people could just know my ideal self, that, then I could really do something in this world. But my question this morning is this, what if we were really known, 
really known. The real us with the good parts and the bad. What if there were just a handful of people in this life where we could truly be our real selves and not just our ideal selves? We long for that, and we want that as a community, and, and it doesn't happen magically. No church magically has that, but usually you have a couple of friendships, and you grow into that over, a, and you, you take that risk little by little with that grace that God gives you. Can we ask for help? The struggle and celebration of life was meant to be lived in community. Can we build a community of authentic confession? This is where I'm really at. This is, these are my struggles. Truthful storytelling. This is the story of my life. I see what God has been doing in my life. I see your, I, I hear your story. I'm encouraged by your story. We're in this together. Hopeful dreaming. Someday God will, God will bring all of this to completion. Someday God will, will, will finish his good, the good work that he's been doing in my life. Jesus and his disciples were a community. The disciples were often honestly asking the hard questions, confessing their moments of faithless heart posture to Jesus, going through real life growth, heart change together. They had developed a relationship with one another and with Jesus and that invited vulnerability. But at times they were so comfortable they forgot what was right in front of them. Mark chapter 4, 37 through 38. Then Jesus returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. This is in Gethsemane before Jesus would be crucified. He says, Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray that, so you, that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus had asked Peter to keep watch. Peter is tempted by the flesh and sleeps. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. We often daydream in life. We often allow distractions to pull our focus from what Jesus has for us. But we're not called to look away from Jesus with our dreams. We're called to desire them through our experience with Jesus. Instead of, the religious rule would be like, I'm just not going to dream anymore. I just don't want to think big. I just, I just, I want to be a realist, and I'm just going to like stay in my little box, and I'm just going to stay safe. And Jesus instead says, I invite you to dream. I invite you to dream, but make me a part of it. Make me, make me a part of your dream. Peter would later be asked by Jesus, do you love me? Peter would say yes, and Jesus would say, feed my sheep. Peter would, Peter would go on to lead and feed Christ's followers with spiritual nourishment. So he didn't just stay in that broken place where he couldn't watch and pray. The Holy Spirit took him into more. The biggest dreams of Peter's heart were discovered and fulfilled as he said yes to loving Jesus. The deepest places and Peter's heart would be met by God's presence. My last point is this this morning. Let God romance your heart. God was meant to be your daydream. God's embrace holds you in the storm. This infinite need, this, this, this self that is just, that we're really, truth. Truthfully, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about discovering what's inside my own heart. Because I know, I know, like, it, it's, like, I know the brokenness that I've seen there, seen there. But can we let our infinite need be met by infinite God? So what is our daydream? What is our escape? Where do we go looking for the embrace that we need? Where is Jesus just beyond our short-sighted vision? Where can we find sustenance? Where can we find this unconditional love that our hearts crave? We know the, we know the answer is Jesus. We know that's why we, 
we drink the cup and we eat the bread. We remember what Christ did on the cross. We, we experience what he's doing in our heart right now in this moment. And we look forward to that day when Jesus would come again and Jesus would, would, would renew this world, make a new, earth, a new heaven and a new earth, that we would see redemption. We would see the whole thing that the whole Bible is pointing to. We would, we would, see, we would see the completion of that. 1 John chapter 4, 16 through 19, John says this, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how God is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. We need food daily to live. Jesus is the bread of life. So if the worship band could come up, we're, uh, we're going to um, we're gonna pass around the cup and the bread. And, uh, and then I will, at the end of this song, um, lead us through, pray us through. And now if, if someone accidentally takes it early or something, it's, it's okay. <laughs> but if you, but uh, we, in, we just, we confess our brokenness this morning. We participate in the Lord's Supper. We want a new beginning once again this morning. We eat the bread, we drink the cup, we participate in this meal in obedience to Jesus. What God did in the past, what God is doing in our hearts today, what God will bring to completion in the future, we ask for all that this morning. Let's respond to Jesus in worship. <clears throat>